pet and cattle service. So in um, this terminology, pets are mainly, uh, mainly those uh, services that um, you kind of uh, nurture, you kind of uh, give names to, uh, you shed a tear when you, it's time to retire them. Um, but cattle are those services that basically are dispensable and easily replaced. And this is only possible when they're provisioned and deployed um, using automated tools. So this is where infrastructure as code comes in. Um, it allows you to do a lot of reproducible builds. It allows you to do um, a lot of peer review um, as though it's just any part of application code. But in this case, it's concerning the infrastructure. <coughs> so okay, just a quick demo context of uh, what I'm going to be demonstrating. So I would like to provision and deploy Jenkins on Google Compute Engine. And uh, it will contain one Jenkins job to build um, a single container from a remote repo. So just to explain what it's going to look like. This is the desired outcome, where it's deployed. And um, it's very simple. This is not production ready at all. Um, it's just as a demonstration for um, what um, this process uh, can do. So I can sign in. And as you notice, this is also reproducible on my local. And I find that it's very important to have some very quick feedback loop, uh, especially when it comes to developing the tools that our people are using. Because um, if there's any bugs in the tools that I'm building, um, it's going to disrupt the workflow of everyone else. So there's going to be a very um, negative, uh, larger scale uh, effect. If let's say you know I redeploy something that is wrong. So as you can see, this is the one which is deployed. If I run this job, as well as running this job, they should be able to build a single container. So Jenkins is just a just an example of a service that I wanted to demonstrate. Um, because traditionally, it is one of those services that uh, people look after. People um, configure manually through the UI. Um, they add in the different plugins. Um, and basically, it causes a lot of havoc. Uh, if, let's say, you need to recreate the server, or you need to redeploy the entire thing. So in this case, it's running Docker, and it's building the container. So this is pretty much um, the desired outcome of the provisioning exercise. So actually, the first thing um, that I would like to emphasize in this talk is that it's not so much about the tools that you use, it's more about understanding the problem, um, and after that, finding the right tools that uh, basically solve the problem in a way that uh, is specific to this use case. <coughs> so um, the first thing I only do when it comes to uh, converting maybe a legacy service that uh, manually configuring or manually maintaining for many years, I need to understand what the service requires. So firstly, is the service stateful? Um, if it is, can this state be stored remotely, maybe by linking up with a DB, or maybe uh, through some kind of snapshotting? Um, and the bigger question is that, is retaining the state even necessary? If let's say I redeploy a brand new, uh, a brand new Jenkins server, uh, do I need the historical um, accounts of all the jobs that I've run? So if, um, let's say we don't need to store this state, we don't need to retain this state, um, it just becomes a bit of an inconvenience, but it's not a deal breaker. <coughs> so I can demonstrate that by basically tearing down everything. So if I destroy this on my local, and I bring it up again, While this is loading, I can show what will happen when we recreate the server. So basically, we uh, in this use case, we will not be storing the state, um, but we need it to be at a usable um, in a usable place when we recreate the server. So the next thing I would normally ask is that what kind of manual configuration is traditionally required? So uh, in the case of Jenkins, for example, um, I need to firstly install Jenkins. I need to uh, upgrade the plugins. I need to 
be able to do some configuration on startup. So um, these things are normally done through the UI. And the next question I'll ask is whether it can be automated using any tools or any of the inbuilt systems um, that the service has. <coughs> And the third point I'll ask is that um, what kind of internal or external dependencies are required for the service to function? So for example, um, if let's say it runs uh, on Java, can it run uh, on Java 8 only? Or uh, can it run on you know, Java 11 or anything else? Um, and whether or not the minor versions were affected. So this uh, determines how critical version locking is uh, of the internal and external dependencies. And if anyone has run into any issues with, um, for example, the plugins uh, versions shifting when it gets automatically updated, um, do I need to implement version locking? <coughs> and because this finally determines how uh, reliably I can reproduce this server. If let's say I, uh, you know, provision it today, provision it three months on the road. Um, by not locking certain dependencies, um, what kind of impact would that have? Um, preferably, it would not have a huge impact, but in some kinds of services and some kinds of projects, it might have an effect. And finally, it's something that I feel is quite underrated. Um, it's about being able to replicate the provisioning process locally. Because uh, to, be, to need to deploy these things, um, just to be able to find out whether my changes have taken effect, is way too slow um, um, a kind of uh, feedback loop. And uh, it might introduce some kind of other unrelated issues if let's say I'm, I'm deploying it and expecting it to work uh, on the cloud. So okay, um, some of the tools we're using at Vigo right now for this provisioning step is uh, Packer together with Ansible. And locally, we are using Vagrant um, to reproduce the provisioning steps um, that we normally do on Compute Engine images. So let me just jump into some code. So this repo is open source. I've put it on my GitHub. Uh, you can refer to it maybe after this talk if you would like. So the first thing that um, we were trying to solve is that we wanted to have a level of abstraction when it comes to um, running some kind of automated uh, Builds. So regardless of, regardless of the targets that I'm trying to deploy to, I would still like to re reuse some of the components. Because uh, we are in somewhat of a, a special situation where we are on both GCP as well as a different cloud. Um, and we would like to reuse uh, some of these, uh, some of the modules and a lot of the processes uh, when it comes to uh, provisioning and maintaining these machines. What was your motivation to pick up those tools, not mm. something else? Why not, uh, Jeff? Why not, mm. Jeff? Why not? Yeah. So at least um, when it comes to the tools, uh, these were the ones that we evaluated. So I guess there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can do it. Um, and the good thing is that, for example, Packer, it's the secret weapon. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you guys have heard of Packer, but um, it's probably one of my favorite HashiCorp uh, tools mainly because it allows integration for Chef, uh, Ansible, and basically a whole bunch of other stuff. And the whole point of it is that we can use the same, okay, so this is what I use to provision. It uses the same provisioner, which in this case, is a file provisioner, I'm copying over something. It's running a shell script, and finally it's running Ansible. But as we can see, it can build two different types of images one Vagrant and one Google Compute. So this is great because um, very rarely we can talk about cloud agnostic uh, tools. So in this case, this is basically cloud agnostic. It doesn't care where you're deploying to. You can deploy to AWS, you can deploy to uh, Google Cloud, you can deploy to Vagrant, or, or build images for those, for those platforms. And the only thing that you need to do is to configure the builders, which would determine where these images are being built and stored. <coughs> so in this case, let me just run through um, what it's like. 
So the very first thing is doing, okay, let me just give an introduction on uh, what Ansible is as well. So Ansible is quite, um, it, it covers quite a lot of ground with uh, maybe salt, uh, chef. Um, it's basically a way that you can automate um, the different steps when it comes to installing things, when it comes to configuring things, when it comes to um, templating things. And the reason why we chose Ansible is mainly because um, it's a bit more declarative uh, than the other languages. So when it, uh, or the other scripting frameworks. Um, we used to use Chef. It got slightly difficult to maintain. Uh, Ansible was a little bit more straightforward because it was less expressive. So uh, it's a bit counterintuitive, but we found that it made it a bit more sim simple to understand and maintain um, because it had quite a strict uh, syntax. And also one of the things that we're able to leverage on by using something like this is that we can use um, other dependencies, which in this case comes from Ansible Galaxy. So if I want to install Jenkins, I just need to use an open source uh, Galaxy role. And the great thing is that you know uh, this is a fairly popular, fairly well-maintained role. Um, and uh, it's quite battle tested and there's enough tests being run on it. So we don't have to take on the responsibility of testing out uh, these scripts. So to see in action, this is building um, a Vagrant machine. And this is using the same steps to build um, one for, for Compute Engine. So these steps are pretty much the same, uh, except the steps that, um, that the provisioner will go through are exactly the same, except they're targeting different builders. So this kind of ensures that um, you are able to test it quite reliably um, locally. So, okay, within this, um, this shell script, the first thing it's doing is that installing Ansible because uh, the Ubuntu machines do not come with Ansible. And it's a very simple shell script. It's just really an update, installing Python, and installing a specific version of Ansible. And beyond that, Ansible takes over the rest. It also gives the opportunity to, um, so Ansible comes with some uh, inbuilt features, such as the vault, um, where you can kind of um, encrypt whatever variables you need. So in this case, I'm encrypting the username and password for this. And when I'm deploying, uh, I can copy over the, uh, the vault key to be able to um, encrypt it. And the actual job to be able to install everything is fairly simple because I'm using um, this open source role uh, from Ansible Galaxy. And all I need to do is to specify the Jenkins version and a few other things, such as the plugins that I need. And after that, since I need to manage the jobs as well, um, I'm able to template and basically um, have a C job to be able to run any other jobs that I need. And within this like 60 lines of code, um, this is all that's needed to uh, provision Jenkins, which is uh, notoriously fairly heavy and difficult to configure. All right. So as you can see, these are the things that are be being done. So it's installing and support. And after that, it's just running through the open source script, which uh, helps to install Java and uh, any other dependencies that are required. So actually, the idea of this is mainly to, um, to highlight uh, the importance of being able to reproduce the builds um, when it comes to VMs. So in the world of containers and everything, it's kind of taken for granted that you are able to package up, you are able to, um, to have some, at least some kind of reliability when it comes to reproducing the builds. Um, and I think um, what 
the same concepts can also be brought over to VMs um, using tools like this, where uh, it's able to um, basically spin up the machines that you need, installing everything you need, and save it in, um, in the cloud platforms itself. So as we take a look here, when it comes to deployment, there's a few other things that we need to look after. But this only uh, involves creating the machine images. So now the, the next bit. Um, okay, I'm also going to build it from scratch. So let me just head on everything that I have. So when it comes to deploying uh, this machine, uh, it does not live in isolation. Um, there has to be some kind of uh, other things that we have to build around it. So there's a few requirements when it comes to deploying this. Uh, I would like it to be self-healing. If the instance goes down, um, I need it to come back up in a state that is usable pretty much immediately. Um, and I do not want to do any kind of UI-based configuration, either on the service itself or through um, maybe the cloud console. And when it comes to security, I would like to reduce the attack surface. So definitely no direct SSH access, because there are whole scanners everywhere. Um, and the web UI is only to be exposed via the load balancer, and um, the rest of the parts are not. So just a quick infrastructure overview. Um, when it comes to how uh, we would like the rest of the infrastructure around Jenkins to, to react. So it will live within the VPC, with a public and private subnet. So in the, pub, in the private subnet, um, there would be no IP address assigned to the instance itself. So you wouldn't, be, um, you wouldn't have to worry about firewall rules when it comes to blocking out from the, from the internet. And the only way that um, we are able to access it is through the load balancer from the internet. And the way that uh, Jenkins will be able to access the internet is through a net gateway. And within this, uh, this is from uh, Google Stops. There are a few different components as well. Because um, this is just a bit of background, because I'll be running through the Terraform code. So um, what I found about Terraform was that it's more important to understand what you are trying to achieve rather than the syntax. Because the syntax, you can get lost in it quite easily. Um, so it's a lot easier, basically, to plan out the components that you need, even down to the smaller levels such as this, because all these are considered resources in Terraform. But Terraform is great, because you're able to uh, maintain the state of uh, your infrastructure, and it can do incremental changes. It's able to detect whenever uh, you made something, and uh, it pretty much knows whether to destroy, whether to just update a resource in place. So okay. So I've destroyed this, and let me just destroy everything else. So we'll be starting from scratch. It's a brand new project. So while this is running, let me just explain about the different components. So it can kind of be broken up into two main things. So inside my dev, uh, this dev environment, I would like to set up the network and Jenkins separately. Because if I lump everything together, if let's say I would like to tear it down or uh, introduce something new into uh, the network, um, I would have to mutate quite a lot of other resources. But in this case, by separating the network, which is surrounding Jenkins, and Jenkins itself, um, which requires certain things to function, I'm able to operate on these two things separately. So, then. 
sorry, perils of doing a live demo. OK, but basically, the different components that we need can be found here. So just now, um, when I mentioned about the different services that we need um, surrounding it, we have to create a VPC, which is a virtual private cloud, to kind of isolate the services. And within that, I will have the two different subnets, the public and private subnet. As you can see, it's fairly simple. And we are able to assign different side arrangements to it, so they do not overlap, and we can keep them separate. And finally, for the instance, to be able to talk to the outside world, uh, we're using the fairly new um, Google Managed Net services. So the great thing about listing out code like this is that we are able to reference, um, you know, when someone is doing uh, a brand new PR, they're changing something in the code. Um, we are able to see the diffs. We're able to find out, um, we're able to trace at what point um, has the code changed and what, uh, if let's say a bug was introduced because of that, um, we are able to do all the, 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 the regular software development practices hit by sec and find out um, you know, uh, who changed what and what kind of effect it had. So without destroying the rest of the stuff, we can see that if, let's say, we want to create something brand new for Jenkins, all the different components that were inside um, what we had just now, which was the backend service, and Jenkins itself, when it comes to uh, the, the, the load balancer, uh, all the, the firewall rules as well to allow uh, the load balancer ingress, it can all be represented as code. And we are able to reuse these uh, functions and the different modules and even parameterize it such that if, let's say, we have a brand new environment, so this is the dev environment, if we have one for staging, all we have to do is just make a copy of it and change the bars. If, let's say, we need to change the instance type, it can be traceable here as well. And everything is managed through version control. apply it and basically is able to detect the dependencies and just build out whatever it needs. Yeah, so this is just a quick demonstration. I didn't want to dive too deep into the tools. Um, I just wanted to show um, a bit of an approach that can be taken when it comes to managing infrastructure with code. Uh, of course, there's a lot of different comparable ways of, um, of doing it and comparable tools. Um, but in this case, it was fairly opinionated, and it was just to show um, an approach you can take when it comes to solving the problem of having uh, reproducible ways of provisioning the VMs that you need. So these are the code bases, if you would like to take a look. There isn't a readme on it yet, uh, I'll just do one later. But basically everything that you need uh, to be able to reproduce everything that I have. Uh, can be found on this. So, all right, thank you. Good example of that. Um, you have a preset uh, case, like you have an application, an application requires environment, and uh, in terms of the infrastructure as a code, imagine situations that, that uh, you're running a project like in one month you need to provision 200 virtual machines, second month you need to provision 20 virtual machines, everything else in a different configuration. So it's not a static case. What would be the, your approach to code this kind of thing? Do you define everything in a code in Terraform or do you have a, some kind of way to simplify your own stuff instead of every single time change the configuration settings such a way that for this I need X and so that what's the right way to reduce your new workload? 
So at least for this example, um, it was for those that do not need to scale very dynamically. Um, what we actually run in production, uh, we use Kinecta together with Packer uh, to be able to be able to um, basically define the scaling group in large context. So they are variable when it comes to uh, the minimum, maximum, and desired. Um, but basically what happens is that when the code um, is pushed from CI, um, it's able to build uh, an immutable image containing all the code, all the configuration uh, into um, like a machine image. And that gets put into the template of the other scaling group. So um, at least uh, this stems down the, the, the requirements of needing to provision everything by hand. Um, so we only provision uh, the different services that we have. If let's say we have 12 microservices, it's just 12 different configurations for this. And a lot of them can actually share code. So um, there, isn't, uh, there isn't a huge need. If I say yeah, 200 servers, uh, but there are only 12 um, services, we only need to do the configuration for those 12 services. Any other questions? Uh, you did mention that you did not assign the IPs to the VM, but you were still able to target those. So uh, what? how did you uh, connect to those VMs when you are deploying any software? So for those VMs, um, at least for uh, Okay, so something like this. So in the private subnet, um, the only time that we would need to target the VM is maybe if you need the association to it, um, which we we'll normally have. Uh, you normally have a best in host or a jump box on the public subnet. It's reachable, um, and you're able to jump into the uh, instances in the private subnet. But at least for uh, for Jenkins, the only thing that it needs to receive from the outside world is uh, the web request, and I go to the UI and uh, access it. So that's through the load balancer. And on the load balancer, you're able to target. Um, in Over here, it's just a, it's called a backend service in Google Cloud. So there'll be instance template, as well as uh, the instance group manager. So this instance group manager kind of ensures that uh, at least one, one instance is running at all times. And you're able to target it. So um, it doesn't need to know the IP um, because we are not accessing the instance directly. It's managed through um, the mapping from uh, the load balancer. So I think, yeah, there's a few more uh, components in there, which is kind of from here, um, on how it's able to find it. So it's through you know, the URI map and URL map, sorry, uh, to the backend service, and finally to the instance itself. So all these things are kind of managed by, uh, by Google. Thanks, guys. Any other questions? Thank you.